Museum and um, like to welcome you today. Thank you for being here and coming out on not such a great day. Uh, Warren Macy, standing here looking handsome, is going to be the moderator for this panel discussion today. I think he has, I think he's memorized his questions because uh, all I'm seeing up here is a Potter Pe or a Peeler Pottery book. A Potter Peeler. <laughs> Which is available in the gift shop if y'all don't own one. Uh, see me afterwards. Uh, and without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Warren and uh, listen up and learn. My questions better be under here. Oh, you hit. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm getting old. The memory isn't what it used to be here. Uh, okay. Well, she's already welcomed you, so that's taken care of. I'm going to give you a little bit of history on the museum before we get to our distinguished panel here. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the museum's having a special year this year. This is our 20th anniversary. So we started in 2003. Uh, when we started, we were in the Jones School. We had two rooms, uh, one for storage and one for exhibits. In 2003, we started renting this building. Uh, and sometime down the road, we actually managed to buy this building. So, uh, but when we moved here, we were thinking what we could do to get people into the new museum to see what we had, uh, kind of put us on the map, so to speak. And at that point, we talked to Marge. We thought Peeler Potter would be just the thing to do that. So we talked to Marge, and she agreed to curate an exhibit, and we called it Peeler Pottery, a retrospective. And she brought in pieces from home. She ragged on people to bring in their pieces. We had, a, it was a great exhibit. And as part of that exhibit, we decided we would have Peeler Pottery parties. And we invited the public to bring their pottery in to be photographed, to be seen, shared with others. And the results were utterly amazing. I mean, people, this place was filled. Uh, this table is just covered with pottery. We had tables set up everywhere. They were covered with pottery and people patiently waited to have their pieces photographed. Now Marge had also shared the Peeler collection of photographs. This party was such a success we decided we'd do it again. So we had a second Peeler pottery party. It was equally successful, so why not have a third one? So we had three of these. When we wound up, after doing all this, we had over 2,500 photographs of Peeler Potter. What do you do with that many photographs? We decided we should publish a book. So in 2009, this came out. The title, Peeler Pottery, a retrospective. I was overruled on that. I thought the title should be Peeler Pottery, How Appealing. But <laughs> <laughs> that didn't take off. We're always looking to expand our collection here uh, at the museum. And today you're seeing our newest pieces. You're going to see three that we have not shown before. Two you get to see now, and to see the third one, which is kind of a mystery, you have to wait till the end. Okay. The first you saw when you came in, it was the 24 dozen cookie jar. It was made by Richard uh, while he was at DePaul. Uh, Ralph is here today, Ralph Beeler, wait. Uh, and he mentioned that we know that's at Nepal because you can see in the background the kiln it was fired at Nepal. Uh, the second piece, I should tell you how we came about these. Uh, I got a call from Chris Johnson that they were uh, going to be dispersing Eileen Johnson's collection of Beeler. And through the efforts of Carol Emery, uh, she persuaded him that they should donate a couple pieces to the museum. And he called to ask me if I would come over and pick out what pieces the museum might want. Well, I walked in and there was kitchen table, kitchen floor, covered with feeler, living room floor, another room floor. Uh, and a, but a lot of it was pretty common stuff. But, but two pieces stood out. One was the cookie jar, because it was a very nice big piece. The second was the sun. And so he kindly agreed to donate these two pieces. Uh, I'm attributing the sun to Marge. I would think that would be right. Uh, and I, in looking at it, I kind of, it's not, who did it, Ralph? My father did it. 
Oh, well. <laughs> okay, that kind of changes what I was going to say. <laughs> it's, not, it's not signed, that's why I, um, I just thought it looked like something she would do. Anyway, well, if he did it, then it takes on. I thought he, she might have done it as kind of a self-portrait. I, I could see that the, uh, the bubbly cheeks kind of represented her bubbly personality. The red around the edge, her wonderful red hair, and the fact that it was a sun, the fact that she was just always a ray of sunshine. Yes? I think Richard used Marge in a lot of his things. Could well be. But that's kind of the way I see this piece. Anyway, it's new to the museum. We've got one more new piece we'll bring out at the end just before we start visiting with everybody. Um, we're, not only are we always looking to add to our collection, but we're also always looking to add to our knowledge of the Peelers and Putnam County Pottery. And to that end, we are excited to have three artists with us today. Now, we have, from this end, David Burt, Nancy Lovelock, Todd Wagner. Now, these aren't just artists. Okay? These are special artists. One is, they're potters. Not only are they potters, they're potters with Putnam County Connections. And not only are they potters, potters with Putnam County Connections, they are potters who studied or worked with Richard and Marge Peeler. And uh, one other thing, they're all continuing to pot today. So rather than me telling you about them, I think it'd be better if they told you about themselves. They're much better at it than I would be. Uh, who wants to go first? Nancy said she didn't. So <laughs> <laughs> David, would you like to go? I wasn't here when we were supposed to say not I. <laughs> okay. yeah, you I'll were. First. You were. It was only about five <laughs> minutes ago. I'll go first. Okay. Well, um, I met uh, Mr. Peeler first when I was in grade school, and he uh, was doing these uh, Saturday morning art classes at at the art center at DePaul, and he was a professor there. And I I brought one of the pieces I actually made in that class that Mr. Peeler taught. I made this little uh, ceramic stoneware lion, and I distinctly remember Mr. Peeler uh, instructing me how to hollow it out. I, I, I really remember that. I remember him teaching the whole class and showing me how to do it with the tools so it wouldn't, so it would dry more evenly and wouldn't blow up in the kiln. <clears throat> anyway, Mr. Peeler's been a big influence on on me and my work. I think maybe you can see some of his influence in my pieces here. But yesterday I, I thought, I, I kind of feel like an imposter here because uh, I really only knew the Peelers when I was uh, younger. Uh, they did come to my wedding when I was 24, so I knew them up until about that time. But most of their influence came when I was in uh, grade school, junior high, and high school. But yesterday I thought, well, I, I do feel like kind of an imposter because of that, but uh, I thought I should study for today. So I reread the, the retrospective book, and while going through that, I saw the picture of Mr. Peeler's hammer in there. This isn't Mr. Peeler's. I I, no, I copied. You did. This is my influence. This is Mr. Peeler's influence on me. So I, I copied that. I thought that was just so funny. <laughs> it's kind of fun to smash ugly pots, actually. Until I'm here walking sometime. Yeah, so I, I knew the Peelers when I was young in grade school, and then growing up, um, when we were in high school, Todd and I uh, would frequently go out to the Peelers and visit because the, uh, we were both interested in pottery you know we were doing pottery in high school and <clears throat> so we'd go out there a lot and and talk to them uh, I'm not sure what else I can add I mean they just they both of them just had a big influence on me when I was growing up I wanted to be a potter too I thought they were so cool to have that <laughs> have that shop out there I wanted, I wanted something like that. 
I still don't have it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you might tell us what you've done since then. You just oh, okay. Yeah, well, uh, like I said, I, I did a lot of pottery all the way up through high school, and then in college, I, I was able to take uh, more pottery classes from, oh yeah, this is important too. I, I, I was lucky enough to study under one of the professors at DePaul University, who was a contemporary of Mr. Peeler, that they were colleagues, Karl Marx. And uh, yeah, I, I studied under Karl Marx, and I really liked him because uh, he did stuff that I was interested in. I was interested in making mostly, you know, functional stuff. And, but unfortunately, uh, my time with Carl was cut short because he had to retire early that year, and uh, a replacement came in who I did not like. <laughs> I won't mention any names, but. Uh, he just, he was like the exact opposite of Karl Marx. <laughs> so that was in college, so I, I continued to take pottery classes my four years in college. Then I uh, got hired by Eli Lilly and Company, and I worked as a, uh, in a biology research lab for uh, a number of years and didn't do any more pottery. Oh, one more thing, we go, let's go back in history. But back when I was in high school, uh, I wanted a wheel. You know, I, I had been taking pottery lessons at Interlochen uh, National Arts Camp in the summer, so I knew how to throw pots on the wheel. And I wanted a wheel, and uh, my parents contacted Mr. Peeler and found out that the art department was selling all of their old kick wheels because they were getting electric wheels. So I, I bought one of the, or my parents bought one of the wheels from the art department uh, that I still have today. It's a nice antique kick wheel. And so then, let's jump back to college then. So after college, I started working at Lilly and didn't do any more pottery for about 20 years. And then my youngest daughter enrolled in a pottery class in her high school and I saw that the art department had a really nice Brent wheel and a, and a, and a kiln in their art department that wasn't being used because the, the, uh, the uh, art teacher really didn't know how to throw on the wheel. So I volunteered. I said, well, hey, I, how about if I come in one day a week this semester and you know, work with one student a week, teach them how to, try to teach them how to throw and then they'll have a week on the wheel, and then I'll come in the next Monday. So I started doing that, and I, I thought that was a lot of fun. And uh, I thought I, I should probably start my pottery up again. <laughs> so it was my daughter who really got me back interested in it when she was in high school. And so I, I already had my wheel. I bought a kiln, got a lot of advice from Mr. Wagner because he was already had an established pottery. And uh, yeah, Mr. Wagner was my mentor, helping me get get started with this. <laughs> He's almost as smart as Mr. Peeler. <laughs> you can see Dave has the same sense of humor as Mr. Peeler did. Did you call yeah. him Mr. Wagner? Huh? Yeah, I called him Mr. Wagner. Oh, stop. <laughs> so yeah, so I started my pottery then around 2004, and uh, it's been been a lot of fun ever since. Where are you located? Beach Grove, uh, Indiana. It's uh, on the southeast side of Indianapolis. Okay. Field trip. Nancy, would you like to be second? Why, sure. Okay. Well, I just um, thank you all for coming, for starters, and, um, and it's a pleasure to be here. I, Nancy Wells, love it, and I have met Richard Peeler when I, in March, I guess, when I was 18 years old, and that's when I met Ralph, when I was 18, because of one of the first things we did uh, when I had, it was my sophomore year at DePaul, and so I took Ceramics One from Richard Peeler, and one of the first things we did was, was make, uh, actually a piece similar to that slab piece, rolled out of slab of clay, and 
this fired it, and then we went out to their uh, home in Reelsville and did a Raku firing, which is a Japanese method of firing, a fast firing, many of you are familiar with that. And so that was quite exciting. We roasted hot dogs over the kiln when the pots were in there. And for those who don't know, you, it, you pull them out when they're still red hot after about 35, 40 minutes and put them in sawdust and water. You know, that's why they get some unusual effects. They're not pieces that you eat off of or, or functional from that standpoint. But anyway, that was my first introduction to Richard Peter, but um, my second memory of that ceramics one class, it's different from how they teach it today, was um, uh, I was writing this, I said, what's that formula for clay? So the first, I remember him writing this on the board, uh, alumina, silica, and water. We had to know the, 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 the formula for clay, and, we ha and that was important. And, and so uh, my, my first semester with Richard Peeler was when I first appreciated inorganic chemistry. You know, uh, oh, now I see why. You know, it's sort of like, uh, not that I was ever big on chemistry, but it suddenly meant something. And I realized that that was so important to uh, knowing about the composition of the clay and the different kinds of clay and how the different kinds of clay would impact what you made and how, how you fired it and et cetera, et cetera. But the beauty of how he taught was he taught technique. He, he taught, you know, you, you were to be, you, he wanted you to be creative, but you had to have a technique. And um, so we watched, we were fortunate when I took it that he had already made his films. Uh, uh, what do we call them now? Peter uh, Ceramic Art Films. Yes, Peter yeah. Ceramic Art Films. They, they weren't made out of clay, but. No, no, <laughs> that he, he, and Marge, he and Marge, you know, produced. He, he, he traveled and filmed. Ralph, Ralph could probably say more about it, but film different potters in this country and in uh, Japan. And, uh, and then he himself, with Marge, I guess, as the photographer, Richard Peeler would demonstrate on the film how to, to do hand building and the different techniques for working with clay. And so um, uh, to, me, to me, one example of what kind of professor he was to a beginning student is I have of some pieces I made my first semester with Richard Peeler and my first year. So this is one of them. And so it, this assignment, actually I have the assignment sheet right here. I found this when I was going through things, was to make um, uh, a slab piece. And he, I guess I must have been looking around at what he made and what the advanced students made. I look at that now and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, even now I would think that's kind of big. And I now know all the things that can go wrong when you try to make that big of a piece. But at the time I didn't know, so you know, you just do it. But um, I was, so anyway, I made this slab piece, uh, and, and for those who work with clay, you, you, it's like you're making biscuits, or you roll out the slabs of clay, but the biggest thing in working with clay is dryness. So when they get stiff, but not too stiff, then you can stand them up, and we're using coils of clay on the inside and slip and the different techniques that you learn, that I learned from Richard Peeler, you can make it stay together. And then I did not have the skill to make, this part right here is thrown in the potter's wheel. And I did not have the skill to do that at that juncture. So I, I recall that uh, Mr. Peeler was demonstrating to me how you could make this. He made this on it. And, and then he sliced it so that I couldn't use, use it, right? <laughs> but being very creative, I managed to salvage it and so that's why this piece, <laughs> yeah, and then I did that. And I was telling Mickey Meehan when I, that I, the, the positive and negative design I attribute to her husband, Bill Meehan, who I had for design my, my freshman year. And uh, anyway, and basically that. And the other piece I made in, in uh, Richard Peter's class that I brought, another slab piece, um, by then I could throw, this is weak, I think, in, in the throwing, but I, I could do this part. But I got in making this piece what we, who've been students of his, call the look. Did it give the look I, when I you got were- I got that in here too, yeah, you the, have the look. look in there? Yeah. Um, I'm interested to hear about your look. Did you get the look when you were a young person? <laughs> well, the look, I didn't know what the look was, but I got it. Because I was, <laughs> what I was doing was I found this piece of a uh, rubber textured thing, who knows what it was actually, and I'm thinking, oh, I think I'll just roll this clay out 
in that texture and make this texture. And while I was doing that, I can almost, I can still see him kind of walk by behind me, and I just remember this look I got. No comment, just a look. You can probably describe it better, but anyway. So um, I, not really realizing what the look meant, I kept working. And um, when we had the critique, uh, it was outside, so it was in the spring, and he, um, all Peeler said was, I didn't think that would work. So what I was doing, I now know, was um, something that shouldn't have, should not have worked because it should have stuck. And that showed to me what a good professor he was because looking back on it, when I was teaching, I probably would have said, oh, that's not going to work. Or, but he let you make your own mistakes, you know. And uh, so that was one example. And uh, so when we talked about collaborative pieces years and years later, 40 years later with Marge Peeler, I realized I had a collaborative piece with Richard Peeler on this since he made this piece of it. And then um, later, 10 years later, when I was teaching at a small college, and had, he came down and he demonstrated this picture form, and then he left it unglazed. And I glazed it, so I thought I had two collaborative pieces. It's not signed. <laughs> but anyway, um, so as I'm, I'm focusing more on how he was as a professor. He, he, was, he just really learned technique. Uh, for example, when we were learning to throw, uh, we had to calculate the shrinkage of the clay because from when it's wet, you know, the air, the air dries out so it shrinks some. And then we fire it the first time, it shrinks a little bit more. When you fire it, the glaze firing, it shrinks a little bit more. And every clay body will shrink a different percentage depending upon the clay and, and how you fire it. So we had to make a bowl that was eight inches in diameter. <coughs> well, I remember very clearly my first year of ceramics that I didn't, I made my bowl ended up being seven and seven eighths. So I did not get it made because it was, you know, not exactly eight inches. Um, and then Richard Peeler uh, quit teaching after my first year. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but he, uh, uh, I think was, which was my, I had kind of the same experience of you're having a, someone come in who was completely different in teaching. And I learned different things from David Harold, but I was always so thankful for the background and the basics that I learned from Richard Peeler um, and because it helped me when I taught and it also helped me just the technique. And I see students today who are very creative, but sometimes they things will fall apart or they'll crack. And it's because they didn't have that some of the basics early on. But as a mentor, um, he also was great. Uh, when I was teaching art at a, a college, teaching art at the summer, one summer Marge was was not feeling well, was ill, and so I came out and helped glaze in the summer. I just thought that was heaven. I drove over from Indianapolis to help Richard Peter, Mr. Peter glaze. But one of my memories that's extremely vivid, I can. I, and I, was that I, it was maybe it wasn't that one, but I had to help glaze one that size. And my job was in this big bucket of glaze. So I had to hold my, one side of it while we dipped it into that. And it was heavy. And I just remember thinking, oh Lord in heaven, let me not drop this. <laughs> you know, it was, it was really, for me, a frightening moment because it was meant so much, but anyway, I did that. And then later when I had the opportunity to be a resident potter in a small college, uh, he kept, he, well, here we are. Richard Peeler and Marge kept in contact. And, you know, when I had a question about something, uh, they would, you know, always be, would advise me. And uh, I'd been there about three years and received a budget to build a new kiln. I didn't, I, I had taken a kiln building workshop but I, you know, one summer, but I didn't know Tilly squat really about building a kiln, nor what to order, the different size bricks. So I call him. Well, you know, I've been looking in books, and did he have one he would recommend, whatever. And I guess it was a couple days later, he calls. Well, Nancy, I couldn't sleep last night, so I designed a kiln for you. And that meant he designed every kind of you, you need you know, 
25 of this angle brick, and I mean, and I, and I still have that, you know, that design. So he sent that to me, and I was able to meet the deadline to my department chair and order things and get that built. And, um, and then I think I'm in fundraising now. Many of you know I'm in fundraising. I think this is one of my early fundraising. I had no budget for visiting artists. And somewhere in the mix of things, I'm talking with Richard, and by then I was probably, I'm not sure when I stopped calling him Mr. Peeler, but somewhere in there I did, but I might have still been saying Mr. Peeler. But he, they offered to come down and teach a workshop for my students for free, no budget. So um, they came down and I organized an exhibit and they sold a lot of work and, um, uh, and it, was, it was very successful and it was great fun. And um, that's when he made that, that one picture form that, um, that I glazed. But, you know, he gave me advice I didn't always take. So early on, when I was had the opportunity to, to, to be at this small college, and I had worked for a couple of potters, he said, okay, Nancy, what I advise you to do is to pick one shape and, and just make that shape. I, I make a hundred of that shape. Well, I never really did that, so I still feel like it's an assignment I need to do. <laughs> so, but anyway, yeah, I've made a lot of pictures, but not like he said, and, and that was good advice. Um, and, you know, just, uh, you know, I think I've spoken enough right now, but I want to do some questions for some other things to come out. But he was, he was a mentor, as was Marge, and um, what I appreciate the most in summary about Richard Peeler was his, um, his dedication to uh, teaching and to keep in contact with former students, not just me, but other students over the years, and who I know now because it, because of that interconnections. You know, I was. That's it. Okay, thank you. Hi. I just want everybody to know we didn't receive the questions ahead of time. We didn't. <laughs> and my wife, who I like to call the other Potter. It's right back there. Sue Wag, stand up, Sue. Go ahead, stand up. <laughs> That's the other potter. And she's heard me talk a lot about this ad nauseum. And I said, it's not about me. I'm not going to talk about myself. I'll talk about the peelers. And now you're asking me to talk about myself. So I'm totally unprepared. So I'm going to keep it very short. <laughs> uh, my wife's going, oh, no. <laughs> so first of all, thank you for having this museum and thank you to Lisa wherever she's probably up front and there she is and and let's take a moment to remember Sally Gray oh yes um, Sally would walk up to me and I'd say yes and she'd go I didn't even ask you <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's wonderful to see all the pure work and it's it's an honor to be part of this um, I first found clay in my grandma's creek Deer Creek in Rush County we used it to plug up the rock dam and keep the water to back it up into the farmer's pig lot next door, and we did once. And after that, we, we didn't do it anymore. <laughs> Later on, the farmer said, I thought that was pretty neat you did that, but at the time, we, we got a big talking to. Um, built little Pueblo things in the creek bed and used it to make little balls and throw at our cousins. And so that was my first experience with clay and I think the first time I saw Mr. Peter was at the Saturday morning the art things that went on and, and my dad said you know if you'd listen to him you'd learn something and uh, <laughs> he was right it just took me a while and then Dave and I would go out and visit the Peelers one time we went out there and he said why aren't your boys in school you remember that <laughs> I, guess we, I think we had, had gone I don't, I don't remember Maybe I do not was, recall. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I want to quick touch on the look. Um, so if you don't mind, so we, well, this we were out there, and I when we got the there, it may not have been on the day that we might have been playing hooky, and and uh, Mr. Peter was putting up some ceiling tile. Do you remember this story? And he was up on the ladder, and uh, he asked, we asked if we could help, and he said. Yes, could you get my glasses for me? <laughs> Remember that, Dave? And luckily, I do recall. <laughs> Dave, 
he was putting the glasses on Mr. Pugh. He said, just put them on me while I'm doing this. He had his arms up, and you were having a hard time. It's hard to put somebody else's glasses on. I poked him in the eye. I poked him in the eye, <laughs> and he kept fumbling around at which point I thought it was kind of funny, you know, and I got the look. <laughs> I got the look. It wasn't funny, and, uh, and of course, we, we had a lot of wonderful visits out there. Then I took ceramics in high school as a sophomore, as a junior, um, I took ceramics, I took art class with Chris Brown. Um, and I took, in fact, it's a funny story, Mrs. Meehan may appreciate this or may not. I really liked Cindy Poor and Carly Meehan, and they were both in art class, so I took art. <laughs> <laughs> and Cindy worked on the potter's wheel, and, and Carly did hand building, so I still do hand building. And, and, and that was a great experience, and Chris was a wonderful teacher. Um, you had Chris too, right? You had Mr. Burplank before you know, yeah. And by the way, I don't think Mr. Peeler would have liked the teacher that followed Karl Marx either. He made really unusual art things without much technique. The guy gave me a B. <laughs> <laughs> I was getting straight A's from Dr. Marx, and when I asked the replacement, why I got a B, he, he told me, nobody deserves an A. Uh, that's <laughs> and you know, if you, I hate when teachers say if, you, if you got the look for Mr. Peter, you knew eventually what it meant, but also if you got a compliment, it really meant something, because I take something out there and go, what do you think? He goes, oh, keep, keep working on it, <laughs> keep working on it. But when he said, I like that, that's pretty good, you'd think, and that's really something. And the same was true of the three Richards I had in uh, school. Richard Hay, Richard Burke, it helped us a lot, um, and, and uh, Richard Peeler, and all three of them. If you were to get a compliment from them, it really meant something. Um, so um, I shouldn't go on and on. I went to Ball State, um, I studied, in fact, Mr. Peeler suggested that I might go to Ball State, where Marvin Reichel was, who was a good instructor, and he retired Why the year I was there. Yeah, and I went, and after that, I wanted to do salt glaze, like Richard Burkett did so wonderfully. So Mr. Peeler suggested I go to the University of Wisconsin to study with Don Wrights, who took a sabbatical. <laughs> <laughs> he took a sabbatical to go to Australia. But I ended up having Bruce Breckenridge, who Richard Burkett would say was a wonderful teacher and, and studied with him also, so that worked out fine. But then I ran, it just didn't, I don't want to go into why I didn't finish at University of Wisconsin, but I came back to Terre Haute and I was living in Terre Haute with Bob Gammon's tw twin brothers, <laughs> playing in the random band and working at the Zonka Tavern. And I wasn't in school. Now, somewhere in there, we worked at the Bloomington Pottery, too. That's right. And after working at the Bloomington no, Pottery... No, was after, wasn't it? Well, I, I made production pottery. Then I moved to Terre Haute. That's where I got the nickname Chuck Rumor, because I just oh. left and moved to Terre Haute. Clifford came and picked me up. And I moved to Terre Haute, lived with Clifford and Dave, played in the random band with Doug Hubble on the drums. and. Uh, so anyway, I was working at the Zonka Tavern, and I was playing in a fairly unsuccessful band in a house that didn't always have, but we had a good time, utilities, and, and I met my wife, took now my wife, the other potter, Susan Wagoner, and so I really liked her a lot, and uh, <laughs> I really did, and so, uh, in fact, I was just about to join the Coast Guard. I had a plan to talk about any of it. Probably better than remember what I said. Don't let me talk extemporaneously. So I've got notes. I'm about to move on to the last part. But this is a fun story, and this is how we ended up at Billy Creek, which was thanks to the Peelers again, where we were potters for 30 years together. Um, I was going out to dinner with Sue's mother. And uh, she, you know, it was the first dinner with the parent. And, and uh, she said, so what do you do? And I was like, uh-oh. 
<laughs> I didn't want to say, well, I, I, I came to Zonka Tavern in the morning and I'm the only sober person in the bar at night because that's how he hired me. He said, I need one sober person in the Zonka. And, and, and then I play in the band with these guys and we really don't play out, but we play a lot and stuff. And so I went, I'm going to school. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to ISU to be a teacher. What I really meant was I'm going to sign up real quickly. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what happens. And Sue looked at me like, well, what else do I not know about you? <laughs> true story, true story. Anyway, so I signed up for ceramics. I had Richard Hay. He taught us kiln building. He taught us glaze calc. In fact, one time I was making a set of dishes for Sue's brother, and I was hiding all the functional pottery in different cabinets because Dick Hay didn't like functional pottery. Your dad had some discussions with him about that. And uh, one day I went in and everybody was looking like this and Dick went, I want to show you something. He opened up all these cabinets, he found all the pottery and he said, if you make one more pot, I'll kick you out of my classes. And one of the grad students took me aside, I was mad, and uh, he said, Dick will kick you out, but you should take kiln building and glaze calculation. I did, they were great classes. Then we were getting ready to move to Michigan to get, I was looking for teaching jobs, my parents lived up there. and. I visited the Peelers, and Mr. Peeler had a little yellow piece of paper, and he said, I've got the name of somebody at uh, this place, and they were interested in finding a potter. And it was Kay Hines, it was from Billy Creek Village, and uh, it turned out that the Peelers had told them to call ISU and ask for Todd. Well, nobody knew Todd, because by then I was Chuck Rumor, because I had left and moved to Terre Haute, I was going by Charles and Chuck. So I almost missed my chance, but Mr. Peeler saved that little piece of paper, and we ended up at Billy Creek, and we made pottery together, um, and I probably have talked enough, so. <laughs> <laughs> You're talking about Richard and his glasses, reminded me of the story of Richard and his glasses. Uh, when he, Richard had started turning wood, and he, really like burls out of trees and things like that. And at the time, I was kind of co-owner of, for tax purposes, we'll call it tree farm, uh, down in Owen County. And we had one tree there that was about 16 inches in diameter, uh, had a, about eight feet up, had a burl that was like this, totally encircled the tree. So I described it to Richard and he said, yeah, he'd love to have that. So it wasn't, valuable for selling the tree, so I cut the tree down, cut the burl out with about, I don't know, a foot on each side of it or so of the tree. And then Richard went with me to get the burl. We got a pickup truck, we got out there, and probably took us a half hour, we finally wrestled the burl into the back of the pickup truck, and at that time Richard noticed that he didn't have his glasses. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we, we looked for probably a half hour through the leaves and everywhere. Never found Richard's glasses. So out of the deal, let's see, I got a really nice bowl that he made out of the burl, and Richard got the rest of the burl and a new pair of glasses. So it was a good deal. <laughs> I, I helped him go, when we were dead mixing clay, and I thought it was time to go home. Um, in fact, I was supposed to go to Steve Baker's house on the way home, and he said, oh, would you mind helping me get this Something out of the woods, and it was a giant burl. I said, that's never going to fit in your truck. But he didn't lose his glasses, so. <laughs> and he did fit in. All right. I've got to ask just a couple questions that uh, have been submitted by our uh, exhibit committee, and then we'll have some questions from you all. Uh, one of the first one that they had was, you may have, most of you maybe said something about this, but the question was, what do you value the most uh, Richard's influence on your work. Well, for me, I think I mentioned it, just the, the, the basics, you know, learning early on uh, a strong technique that could then allow you to experiment and try new things, which, um, you know, play plays what I suppose the special thing about clay is you, it, it can be your worst enemy unless you, if you don't, you know, it'll do all kinds of things, but if you understand how to work with it 
do it. You can pretty much do anything. It's amazing. And I can't do anything. When you look at the, the plethora of different objects and whether they be functional or not functional, um, you know, is what makes it you know, fun. Dave, want to add anything? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think for me it's just uh, paying attention to detail. You know, I look at, had always looked at the peeler's work and thought, this stuff is perfect, you know. You can't find any, you know, little nicks or chunks of clay that don't belong. So when I make, when I make my pottery, you know, especially when I make the, I don't, I guess I didn't bring any hand-built stuff. I, I like to make slab pottery too. And I spend a lot of time just, you know, looking at the pot at all angles and turning it and just trying to make it perfect if I can. There's one here that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I did that on purpose. <laughs> So to, for me, it's the quality of the work. Just try to do the, you know, the best quality job that I that I can. Well, well we I have we have this memory. I have this memory. I'm sure all my fellow students uh, do as well. Of Richard Peter taking a uh, hammer. I'm not sure it was a hammer. They had they had a hammer in a studio that said quality control. I'm not sure if we have one at the Paul. We must have. And pulling out of the kiln, the beautiful round bottle shapes that take a lot of skill to make. It took me years, you know, to be able to make shapes like that. And um, breaking them. They were white. They were gorgeous. But his, what he was, it was supposed to be a, a copper red, which is a type of uh, um, color in a reduction, high fire, that, that comes from the atmosphere. And sometimes it doesn't work. And they come out kind of gray looking. And so he was breaking those pieces because they were seconds. So anyway, whatever that's. Uh, that's that a tough crazy. question, <laughs> but I, I I know for me, watching Marge and Richard work together, and he liked to say we're a mom and pop industry. And, and, and yeah. sometimes you weren't sure whether you were supposed to laugh or not. Was that funny or is he serious or is he both? And so you see Richard and Marge working together and now I work with my wife and we look to their inspiration working together and I once was there to see Richard, hey I said Richard, I'm calling Mr. Peeler, hand a pot to Marge just kind of bluntly and say here decorate this. Momsy, and, and she took it, and, and so that's a big deal. Um, and one just really quick story: um, when my wife was carrying our daughter about two months before she was due, they really didn't want Sue to do much, be around chemicals, work around the wheels, and so I thought, well, we'll make half as much pottery, half the business, half the factory's not here, so. And, and the whole place came to a screeching halt. <laughs> because, and I appreciate, I mean, I really did, Sue, I appreciated you, but I had no idea, like pricing and displaying pottery or some of the detailed things that they saw about, I just, ugh, I couldn't do that very well. And I see Arthur Harris and Becky Harris here, and a lot of you love their maple syrup products. And I know if you've been out to watch them, and like the peers, they graciously will show you what they do while they're working. Um, if, if one of them wasn't doing it, I guess I could speak for you. It would come to a screeching halt. I watched Arthur make the candy and Becky bag it up. And, you know, it, it's so getting to watch them. And it's wonderful to hear people say Richard and Marge, because there's been times where people talk about just Mr. Peeler. So. And Ralph remembers the, the, the little gravestone that she made that said mom and it had laundry on it and bowls and all kinds of things and said mom she did a lot. I don't know if it said on the other side but it was never enough. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> I told this computer I love that. He said I don't know it's awfully creative. So, anyway. <laughs> mom and pop industry. Okay. Uh, close to that. What was it about Marge Peeler's approach to making 
pots that appeal to you? Any particular aspect that you try to emulate in spirit or in appearance or effect? Nancy's got her eyes lit up, she's ready. Well, you know, Marge was such a wonderful artist and she was very much uh, Richard Peter's equal in art. You know, I, I saw their high school portfolio when, um, when, when the summer I was helping him glaze and pulled him out under the bed and just, I was just blown away by, by the work Marge did. And, um, and she was a sculptor as well. And, there is, a, I saw a photo, I, was, I actually did a presentation on Marge for a national conference after she passed away. And um, in researching that, it just was so apparent that uh, Marge, you know, lived in an era where she was an equal artist, but she was female. So as a couple, uh, her husband got to be the artist to get the MFA and teach and be the potter. And she, you know, raised four sons and her big, she said, she, I saw these when she was in was it Minnesota, University of Minnesota. She went uh, these incredible ice sculptures that she did, other sculptures, uh, amazing. She, so then she said her biggest sculpture project was their home, because after they did the ran dirt, all this, all the, you know, it was, it was rough, perpendicular edges, and so anyone who saw their home, they're all smooth and even. So she sculpted it. She she did it with a chisel, right, Ralph? Trial, whatever. Whatever she did. And so, um, but she was an artist in her own right and uh, was so happy when, when her husband stopped teaching at DePaul and became a potter full time because then she was able to be, well, you know, the boys were grown to be an artist in her own right. And, and so, uh, and, I, and a lot of early in the, in the, I've been reading about this recently in the 60s, the, um, 50s and 60s, a lot of the high fire pots with a lot of earth tones, brown tones, and you, you know, of course, a lot of what Richard Peeler did were the browns and things, and that was very much the trend. And Marge was like, we need to do blue, you know, and he really wasn't in favor of doing blue right away. And so, um, but she convinced him we need to do blue. And then um, another thing, you know, Marge said, you know, cute cells. So she, really, you know, we need, we need to make a lot of, whim she made so many of the whimsical things, and then they, they also filled every square inch of the kiln, you know, so they wouldn't waste any space. Um, so, you know, I think that, you know, I agree. I, I, for myself, trying to be a potter on my own was, I even had a cushion situation of, of being a resident artist, so I didn't have a lot of overhead, but, um, it's hard, you know. I mean, you try to do all the different things, and I think that uh, having the team effort makes a big difference. One reason I realize it's more than I could do. So, but I think Marge is knowing her coming back and really realizing she influenced me to see what she did in her 70s and 80s. And she published articles in like six magazines. She wrote several children's books. She worked with, you know. She couldn't throw on her own. You know, she never really made big pieces, but she she got to a point where she really couldn't throw at all. And um, so it was, you know, it was fun to make shapes and deliver them to her at Asbury in her house there, and she would carve on them, or I'd make pieces for, say, the frogs and take them to her, and then she put it, put it together. But uh, it was really a joy to be able to do that. Um, she was always an educator, almost always home, always took time to show you things, share things with you. Mr. Peeler was at doing different things that he did as the artist or whatever, but she was home and she would always take time to explain things. Um, she was an educator right till the end. I got to tell this real quick story because it's a large story. I was at Asbury Church Service with my mom, Beverly Wagner, who I had to find a reason to mention her. Some of you know her or knew her, and we were, it was the end of the service, and here came Marge down the sidewalk in front of Asbury, and she'd been pretty ill, and it was good to see her out, and I went out to open the door, and she said, you know, I think I could make it to the Peeler Center. And, and, and we 
talked about it, and, and I said, why don't we ride over there? And she goes, good idea. So we rode over to the Peeler Center, and we went in, and there wasn't there weren't many people there, and Marge left little notes for students. I really like this, could use more color, keep up the good work, <laughs> this is fantastic, I can see nature in it. She left notes all over, the little drawing on the chalkboard. Later, I heard students were just blown away. This is, this, the building's named after the Peelers, and, and um, it was, this, I've got a picture of her, she had a, a, we had a picture taken in front of the pot made in multiple pieces, I can't remember the time, anyway. She was always an educator, and she sure helped us. Sue and I would go visit and say, wow, we feel recharged, because they were always doing something new. And, and you feel like you've got, got a new idea every time you went out there. So that's, she was always sharing. And cute, small, and blue. That was, you know, so. Uh, yeah, I don't really have anything to add about Mrs. Peeler. I didn't know her as well as I did. Mr. Peter, but I do remember, recall her always being there when we went out to visit. Um, even when I, my parents would, took me out to visit the Peelers when I was, uh, you know, in grade school, and I remember her always being there. I just thought of something. Till the day she died, when you called, she'd always answer the phone. Peelers. Yes. It wasn't, you know. huh? it wasn't the way she answered it. Was yeah, Mr. Peeler would say, I was just thinking about you. And then I'd be mixing clay and he would say that when the phone rang and I'd say, you say that to everybody, don't you? And he said, yeah, but I really was thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, what a wonderful margin. We're going to do one more question that we have and then we're going to open it up for questions here. And then we're going to see the one last piece of pottery. Uh, Okay, artists are a different breed of cat. Uh, many tend to be creative in a number of ways beyond their primary art form. For example, Richard turned wood, Marge painted, she uh, worked with textiles, now we've learned she was a sculptor. Uh, have you followed the peelers and branched out in any other field? Now we know Todd did his music, he's already told us about that. That's another art form. <laughs> David, any other art forms that you've... Uh, well, I'm a musician too, but no other, like, fine arts. Like, we've just done the pottery. Depends on how good your music is, whether it's fine art or... It's music. really good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> his music is really good. No, his parents were musicians. In fact, his mom was my cello teacher. Patience. Uh, piano. Yeah, and, and Herman Berg, if you don't know that, Dr. Berg. So, and the Thompson Center is named after your grandfather. The room. Yeah, my uh, grandfather was the dean of the School of Music. My dad married the, uh, the boss's daughter. <laughs> <laughs> Nancy, have you branched out at all? perform anywhere or oh. play it? Yeah, I perform uh, every Sunday at church. <laughs> wow. Nancy, any well, other art um, endeavors? You know, I, I, I think my work, I actually was, you know, making pots as well as I could for a living, and I got an order for uh, mugs for a natural catalog, which was a great order. But that's when I thought, mm, I don't think I'm cut out to make the same thing over and over. I mean, I wasn't enough of a business person. You know, I, I, when I was at DePaul, I needed to have more business courses, but I just, basically, it just kind of broke my spirit. So I decided I needed to do some, get a regular job and have insurance and benefits, blah, blah, blah. So it took me about a year to transition, but I transitioned into uh, volunteer work, first with the American Heart Association, and then with public television, and then got a call one day from Steve Golly, and, you know, I told our president, there's no way I'm going to Greencastle, but I'm going to go up and see how DePaul raises all that money. And um, then, you know, I said, I'm coming. But, and um, so I think fundraising, the work I do, is very creative. I mean, everything's different. Um, and I, I do approach things creatively. Um, um, and I think that it's... Um, 
you know, and a lot of people who are in fundraising appreciate the arts. But I, I think that's um, the one thing that I have done. But at the same time, I've kept my, my little finger in clay, and I've, it's given me the chance to, uh, I've worked in different situations. I've had different studios. <coughs> you know, I've tried wood firing and salt firing. And um, like Richard Peeler, I've kept in contact with some former students, and that's very gratifying to see what they've done. And um, I love going over and seeing what DePaul students are doing. And um, so it's, uh, anyway, I'm just thankful that I, uh, mainly I think that's the creative part. I do calligraphy, I hope you like. I was going to say in the end that all three of you, <coughs> you have to be very creative in getting DePaul people to part with their money. <laughs> uh, David probably was very them. creative in his research with Lily, which kept him there many years. He worked some with Christine and getting the Peter Center stuff done. I got to be on the thanking side of that. Yeah. I, I, for, uh, one of my greatest stories is that one of my friends from college, a classmate and, and Peter student, she and her husband were the ones who gave $12 million to build the New York building. And um, our lives, you know, since our 10-year reunion, obviously she lives in a different stratosphere as far as her, what she does with her life. And she would, um, we collaborated on several things and she, for the Richard Peeler, for our, one, one for a reunion and one for the Richard Peeler exhibit, Christine said, we can't, we can't have serve a uh, punch or wine out of plastic, we've got to have cups. And I'm like, well, we don't have time to do that. It, it, long story of it is, I said, well, if we do that, then you need to come in and help me with the entire process because she, we did it for a reunion and she helped me make the things, but I Marge and I finished it. But anyway, so she'd fly in her private plane to Greencastle and put her overalls on. And I remember Steve Gawley saying, let me get this straight. Christine Rails is flying in to Greencastle to play in the mud? I said, yep. yep. But anyway, that, she loves it. That's our common out, common thing. Was she part of this final class? She wasn't, she, she was. And is that a true story that all the students in this final class went into yes. art related fields? How about that? Yes, it is. They did. Um, even a math major went back to school. Her wow. parents wouldn't let her major in art, so she went back to school. Wow. What does that say? I, teaching, I, I, I ended up being a teacher. You know, and, and, uh, and I like I like to draw. I like nature. I like looking for art in nature. In fact, Val Cushing, who's a famous ceramic artist, commented at Enseek a few years ago. He said, "You know, Richard Peeler was way ahead of everybody else on this getting your ideas from nature." So, I guess drawing nature. I would say probably teaching. To make you one of the uh, most popular teachers in the state of Indiana, most likely, according to your students. <laughs> uh, we are going to open for questions from the audience here. Who has a question? Dorothy. I have two observations I'd like to make. One, Richard Peeler taught in our Sunday school. Wow. Two, Todd has proliferated Richard by cups, bowls that he has, he and his students have made for charity. One other thing you mentioned the films that he made. When were those made? The uh, 60s. 60s. Yeah. The 60s and just yesterday, the museum had a phone call from the Boston Museum of Art wanting to know if we had the copyrights to those because they are wanting to use one of those films in a segment that they are producing. So they're still relevant here today. Okay. I, saved, I saved a bunch of the films and talked with Lisa about donating them to the 16 millimeter films. You still have the original. Yeah, and I have, and when, when you guys were doing all that clean out and everything, and and there was just too many things to save. And, and, and March said, oh, people don't use these anymore. It was kind of a period when they weren't using them. And I, she said, why don't you sell them? And I said, why don't we make them public domain? Anybody can use them. I said, we'll put them on the internet. She said, what's the internet? <laughs> and I said, it's just anywhere but with a computer can listen to Richard's 
voice, and she said, and the music that I helped produce, because she did the music. So they're out there, and the hand building's been viewed, I don't know, 150,000 times, and people are constantly, so they're public domain. I, I used it in a class I taught a couple of years ago. Yeah, you're wonderful. And if you want to see Richard talk, and he even has on the bowl thrower apron. So they're out there, they're very important. Yes? I knew nothing about peelers, knew nothing about pottery, so I worked with Ralph, and he gave me one that, uh, a copy of a film that Todd had put on CD, or whatever it is. Took it home and watched it. Oh my gosh. He was such an inspiring teacher. It made me want to go out in the yard with the shovel and <laughs> dig for clay and work with it. I mean, that was the type of teacher he was. He inspired you to want to do what he was doing. Anybody else has a question? Tom. So I'm curious, great teachers will always tell you that they've learned so much from their students. What would you say Richard learned from you guys? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> workshop for students and then a second time. So he, he learned that I put together a good exhibit for him where he sold a lot of pieces and I did the PR and, and it ended up being a very positive experience. And um, while he was, one of the trips, we visited a, a you know, they called it, it, it was a, I don't know what call, but it was a farm where they built this sort of tree house and he came back and built that upper room in his studio yeah. after he saw that. But, um, and so I was, and he purchased some pottery of mine, which I was like so proud that he did. And then Marge gave it back to me when I got. Oh. So that's, because I you know, oh. when you're a potter, you sell everything. And so the reason you have anything is you see someone's shared the back or, you know, I have all seconds. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you teach the peelers anything? Uh, I think Mr. Peeler learned pretty quickly that if he hit a really short ball in tennis, I would run up and then he would lob it over my head. <laughs> <laughs> he loved that. Oh my gosh, he loved that. Um, and he also learned if he would pause for quite a while, if it was like about a three-foot putt, I probably would eventually give it to him. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I, I'd have to really think about it. I, that's a great question. and, and I. I don't know. I, I, I guess I reminded when Marge told me one time we were mixing clay, she said, you know, Todd, if you just stopped talking for a while, Richard would probably tell some interesting stories. I don't know if he learned anything from me about that, but that's a wonderful question. And, 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 uh, <laughs> I want to tell a quick funny story. So Richard, and maybe there's something we all appreciated about him was his sense of humor. And one time he was doing a talk, at, and he would start out with a joke. And one of my favorite jokes that he told was, one morning they had a little window out back, and he was up in the morning, and he was looking out the back window, and there was a dog in the compost pit or the garbage or something. And he opened up the window and he said, get the hell out of there. And Marge said, okay, I'm getting up. <laughs> <laughs> so, he had a wonderful sense of humor that we all appreciate. Oh, his Jesus part. Oh. What, what did it say, Mr. Feldspar? What was Mr. Feldspar. Yeah. Which a Feldspar is a type of uh, earth material. Um, yeah, and all those, remember all those little tags that he had up in the, in the, if he saw something on TV that said, what you need is a beer that's less filling, he'd write it out and put it up out of context. <laughs> you remember all those little stacks? Yeah. Well, yeah. uh, Richard yeah. was quite the athlete. Oh, and my. We 
years ago, when I was much younger, there was a noontime basketball league here in Greencastle. We started, it started back in Bowman Gym, that's how long ago it was. And, uh, I mean, there were people, good basketball players, like, you know, Keith Gossard, Clyde Spencer, these people were really good. But Richard, probably 20 years older than anybody, he was there every day. Yeah. And his sense of humor was always in the shirt he wore. Instead of the fighting Irish, he wore the fighting Amish. <laughs> always on his shirt. <laughs> He might have well been a professional baseball player if he hadn't injured his knee in World War II. Basketball. And basketball? Yes. Okay, in World War II he injured his knee and uh, he also won the Senior Olympics in shot put and rowing? Something. Yes. Well, that's right. He competed when he got in the 60s. He yeah. was competing yeah. in the 60s. He went to the White River Games and, in fact, to tell that story, but, but I started it. So we were supposed to be mixing clay, and he said, do you have your golf clubs? And I said, yes, and we got in the station wagon, and we were driving off to go play golf, and Mark was standing out by the screen door, like, where are you going? And he said, we'll be back. <laughs> yeah, he was a tremendous competitor. One thing that we don't have here, oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to, to talk about the pieces you brought brought today because they're, they're good stories that for a few of us heard, but not many. Oh, well, tell about your pieces. Yeah, Dave, you can, yeah, yeah. Your pieces. Dave's a scientist, and that's one of the similarities between Dave the Dave, your cop that you brought, that's a yeah. fun story. He's very here about your pieces. Yeah, Richard drew your, your kilns off so meticulously, and Dave has, like, recordings of everything. Yeah, this is, uh, I guess this is Mr. Peeler's uh, humor rubbing off on me. This is uh, called a Pythagorean greedy cup. And it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a prank cup, like a dribble cup, but it's a lot more sophisticated. <laughs> With a name like Pythagoras, I guess it would have to be sophisticated. But anyway, I thought I wanted to make one of these greedy cups. So what it is, you can see inside, there's this dome in there, that's a hollow dome, and at the bottom of the dome, there's a hole so liquid can get into it. And then there's a tube, you can see this tube that's sticking out of the bottom of the cup, that goes clear to the top of the dome, and it's opened, opened up in there. So when you pour water into the cup, you can fill it up halfway, and it's fine. You know, nothing happens. You can drink out of it. There's no dribbling. But if you fill it up, over the top of the dome, then the tube inside fills up and it just siphons the entire <laughs> cup out on the floor. <laughs> I, mean, I kind of like the demo if anybody wants to see it. It is pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah, you fill it up all the way and it, I mean, it just completely drains the whole thing. <laughs> if I do demo it, I'll hold it over a bowl. Oh, <laughs> yeah, water. Water. I, there, there's a mop in the closet. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I like to make. Water? I like to make communion. That's probably not enough. I also make communion ware, and I've. Uh, I uh, I know Mr. Peeler made a lot of communion ware too, but I had never made any, and my pastor asked me to make a communion set for him, and. Uh, I thought, well, yeah, I'll, I'll make him one. I'm going to go ahead and make four of them at the same time. And I took pictures. I gave him the set, and I took photographs of the others, and I put it on my website. And it, it wasn't long after that I started getting calls and emails from people all over the U.S. asking about my communion wear. I mean, I don't get a lot of calls. I probably sell maybe six, seven, or eight communion sets a year. A year. But, uh, I mean, I've, I've even sold them in uh, Hawaii and Alaska. <laughs> but uh, what I'm getting at, so I like to make Christmas presents, too. I gave my pastor one of these, <laughs> <laughs> one of these greedy cups, and I told him, do not use this for communion. You know? I explained it to him. He thought it was a lot of fun, too. <laughs> And I, uh, yeah, I already told you about the lion I made that Mr. Peeler instructed me on. I like to make uh, hand-built stuff. This is a slab pot that I made. It's a 12-sided 
geometric solid called a, a dodecahedron. So I uh, titled this piece the dodecahed urn. <laughs> so yeah, and I've got my quality control hammer. This is for Nancy spoke about how Mr. Peeler had one of the, I had copied this off of Mr. Peeler. I thought it was great. And I've showed this to a lot of other potters and, and they've copied it too. So I think we're spreading Mr. Peeler's influence <laughs> and his humor. What about your piece in the, it was the Purchase Award at one of the shows, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, the, Talking I don't know, is there an scientific? I don't think there's an explanation. Yeah, there's no explanation for what this sculpture is you, in the corner here. That's uh, a reflection of my biology background. That is a uh, replica of a bacterial virus called a, uh, uh, it's called a T4 bacteriophage. And so, and that, that shape on the top of that virus's head is a uh, 20, 20 sided geometric solid called an icosahedron. FYI. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the purchase price at an auction. Yeah, I was really surprised that the museum bought that and I'm a little upset about it because <laughs> I, I didn't really want to sell it. So I put, I put a big price on it that I thought there's no way anybody will ever pay that for it. The museum bought it. <laughs> it was the year of COVID. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's what, yeah, it was 2020 and COVID was blowing up, so I guess the museum thought this virus is what we need to have in here. <laughs> we may be one of the only museums with a ceramic virus. Yeah, T4 bacteria virus. Todd, you want to? Sure. About your pieces? So, I can't emphasize enough um, how important it is to work with my wife. And here's a piece, and really this is something that is important. There, both Marge and Richard said this, there's n there was nothing in their studio that they both didn't participate in in some way. Whether it was loaded in the kiln, whether it was the glaze that was mixed up, and in this case I threw the pot and my wife carved it and I glazed it. In fact, it's Arthur Harris's fault. He's not, I don't think he's probably he had, had to, to leave. Yeah, he probably had to leave to go work on an order. They ordered a bunch of maple syrup uh, jugs and they wanted a bunch of things written on it. Harris sugar bush uh, maple syrup and Indiana pure syrup on the other side and I had to find a way to make a glaze that would show the texture and, and my wife turned it into art. In fact, the mill owner at, at Bridgeton Mill says, Chuck makes the pots and his wife makes them purdy. So that was a glaze that, that we designed to work over that. This is the first pot I made for Chris Brown. And in fact, Dave really did help me get started on the potter's wheel. He was already doing pottery at Interlochen. And, and didn't you say there was a teacher there who had a wall to smash pots on? Yes, that was and, impressive. And, and this is 1974. And that's when I took the class because those two girls were in there, and, uh, and that's normal, it's healthy. Um, but Dave suggested I trim a foot on the bottom. So I trimmed a foot on the bottom, and it says C 74 on it. And this is, I was way ahead of the time, because now drips are really in, real big thick drips and bright glazes, and I, I did drips on this one. Um, so that's my first pot. Um, here's a wood-fired pot that was fired in a wood kiln that the peelers that I helped participate in. This is a raku or raku pot that, that was made in a kiln that Dave and I made um, that we fired from bricks that we, as purloined. the article said, purloined, purloined. from yes. purloined from the old we, Barnaby. We didn't get permission right. to and, take those bricks. And uh, so this is raku, <laughs> um, cute, small and blue. Um, this is a porcelain piece that my wife is really good at making small things. In fact, I'm not going to go on and on, but I'll try not to. But when the peelers came to Billy Creek one time, I was so excited. They came unannounced, and I went, oh, my gosh, it's Richard and Mark Peeler. They're coming across the thing, and they came in. And the first thing they did was 
start to gravitate towards Sue's small things. Oh my gosh, look at this, Richard. Oh, that is amazing. And they bought some of her small things. And then, I don't know, a week or two, 10 days later, I got a note from Mar saying, oh, by the way, Todd, we were hoping to get one of your pieces. <laughs> and I told her, fine. But Sue got the biggest kick out of that because, and it was, and her small things are really special. In fact, she's in a lot of collections. Um, the Amico collection that the owner, Von Sando, bought a couple of her little pieces. This is salt glaze. Um, here's one of my wife's, wife's little uh, cute cat's whimsical. And let's see, this is kind of interesting, or really interesting. Mr. Peeler, before he made pottery on the wheel, he used a wooden, turned wooden pieces, made a mold from it, and then cast or made ceramic pieces. And I want to donate these. I think maybe the museum already has some. Uh, but that was important. And then, um, like Nancy and has some of the special tools, and Dave makes them. These are some of the Peeler's tools. This is a little tool that they made to put holes in camphor things. And here's a little wire cutting tool um, that I've saved. And I have Mr. Peeler's big rolling pin that's in the film. I didn't bring it in, but. And then this is a fettling knife, which probably was originally about this long. And they used it for such a long time, it finally wore down. And Marge used this particular one to bevel the insides of the lanterns that she made. And uh, this is a really special tool. So, um, and we're potters. We're potters. So we make things that people can use. Um, that's important. So, but the most important thing is that I get to do this with my wife. <laughs> Uh, I'm thinking, Mickey, you, you donated all, gave me all those ceramic muslies. Where is she sitting? Right? Yeah, and I, I'm just, I thank you for this because I'm not sure if I would have had this article. This is an article. Um, ceramic Monthly is a magazine that comes out with all kinds of information, technical, uh, and other information for um, artists and potters. And so I, soon after, I was asked to, uh, Gwen contacted me about participating in this. I was uh, going through one of the old magazines. It's my, been my goal to go through them all. And I've just started that this year. And I come across this article. This was the front of the magazine. And then this was uh, the article. This was from 1970. What, what do you want that? 78? Yeah. So, so I remember, this was, Richard Peeler, I remember from college, as a teacher, and so, and it, it, it's a great article. I brought copies to share, and it, you know, it just talks about um, what comes out of this is really, uh, I think, their humil humility about what they did, but also, uh, you know, you know, you just make some comments about, you know, well, you can read it, but about someone saying, oh, um, what about pots that aren't really that good or something like that being sold? And Richard Keeble responds, we know there's a, there's a market for everything, you know, a customer for every kind of piece. And no matter what level, you know, beginning potters or whatever level people are. And one of my joys, I think, with working with clay is that it's not so much what you've made, it's the connection you have with the people who buy your work or maybe who I've given work to. So, you know, all these many years later from when I made a lot of things, it's been really, you know, out of the blue, I'll talk with someone and they'll say, oh, I think of you when I drink my coffee every morning. It might be someone I bought something 40 years ago. And that's, you know, that means a lot. So that's, um, anyways, I want to share this article and I encourage you to take one and, that's one. and read it. Yeah, it's really. You're in here, Ralph. You're in the picture. Oh, yes, and Ralph is in this picture right here. He's in the... Uh, um, 17. He was 17, sitting here talking to his mom, right here. So, Ralph, what would you say? You know, you have... Ralph has a, a lot of information, but uh, we're going to have a whole new thing on uh, the computer. But uh, any comment about that article? Do you remember when they did, took the photographs for this article? I probably took that photograph. <laughs> you probably did for them. 
Uh, the one thing I got to say about my parents is they, they were, art was their life from the beginning to the end. And uh, they did all kinds of pots, I and mean, you can see that in the, the Peeler Pottery book, it's just amazing. And there's a lot of stuff that's not in there. Uh, but they, they made pots. They, they didn't make pots to make money. They made money so they could make pots. Because <laughs> they just enjoyed making art. Yeah. And they always said they could, could have doubled the price of their pottery and they would have still sold it. I, I see on eBay now the stuff is just oh. ridiculous, the prices they got on eBay. A lot of the stuff's not even Kilo pottery that's advertised as Kilo pottery on, the, on eBay. What do you do? <laughs> Uh. Well, I guess I've already mentioned my, you know, about my pots. I mean, I, I you know, these two I made. I, the example of what I think, looking back on it, that an, an 18, 19 year old would make only was a professor who would, uh, at the very beginning, give you good technique, and then and then you can. You know, hopefully figure it out. I mean, I threw my share of pots away as well. You know, I, it turned out really badly. But um, still, um, and letting you make your own mistakes or successes. And one memory is uh, not to look, but I, I we had an assignment uh, to make a, a a form, and then cut out cut out from that form. But you had to use every piece that you cut out somewhere in the sculpture. So I. I made my form and you know it was the 70s and I thought this would make a nice lamp and so I you know put a hole in it and arranged so I could put a light bulb in it and so I'm not sure at what point it was the, it was like the night before the it was due and uh, Mr. Peeler walks by and he he, <clears throat> he looks at it and he says well Nancy that no longer is a sculpture it has a function and so that won't qualify for your assignment. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I had to make it something else, which I did. But you know, it was he was he was. I guess it was a gift. You know, you always say you're some of your professors you like the most are the ones that were the toughest. That's right. He really was. Uh, um, he was. He was disciplinarian as far as what you did. Um, and again, this is my one influence from Marge. I started to do. I had a period of doing my little. How, how did you uh, do that? I mean, tell, explain the technique on that. Oh. Is it over or under, or is it? Uh, I, oh, I used, um, this was a, 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 um, a leech white with one, one of the glazes that they used. <coughs> and um, the blue is from a <coughs> naturally occurring clay, Albany slip, that's, uh, that also is, can be a glaze. And I'd add a, 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 about 5% cobalt carbonate to that. And Albany slip, of course, has been mined out. So no longer exists anymore, but um, but it would be over it. I would do that over it. Beautiful. And I did a lot of. Um, <clears throat> and this was done. These these were done with the tip of a Japanese brush. You just take the brush and just you know just the brush shape on that. I did a lot of, on a lot of my pieces. I did um. Just take the brush, you know, and, and you know, make a mess in the studio, but um, say, the same technique. And again, this is Marge's, I made the bowl, and then she carved on it. You know Marge's tool for carving? A hairpin. Yeah, the little hairpin. She'd make a lot of her carving on her things with a hairpin, or she would use a wooden spoon to make that. The wooden spoon. That, to do that. Um, and of course, um, and as I mentioned, Richard Peeler said to make 100 pictures, which I haven't done, but I have made quite a few. and. Um, he, he taught us how to make handles. That was one of the things. And when I was making my living as a potter, I made a lot of casseroles and soup trains. And this was a honeymoon casserole. It was supposed to be enough for two people. So I sold those for wedding gifts. And then I did bring their 1981 price list. And every year he, Ralphie, every year they, or ever so often, they would increase it by a percentage. So they would end up with that $6.04 for a cream picture. So I don't, I don't know how they do that. So um, that's mainly it. Oh, 
and then a lot of uh, this was made at the at the paw, I believe. The things I made at the paw, I signed "Love It at the Paw," sort of a play on whatever. <laughs> so, okay. Well, I'm going to show you the one piece that maybe some of you can help us with identify and tell us more about it here in a second. And what, what, uh, I, I just want to tell one more story. I got, <laughs> sure. to, I got to tell the Tommy Gunn story. Uh, the, uh, yeah, when I was in high school, uh, my parent we, we had gone to see the uh, Godfather movie. And, uh, <laughs> And uh, you know, high school kids, we were impressed with the with the gangsters and the and the guns they used. So I decided I wanted to make a sculpture of a Thompson submachine gun, and I did that. And I entered it in one of the art shows that were, were at the at the uh, you know here at DePaul. And Mr. Peeler was one of the judges for the for that show. So I had my Tommy gun that I had made. I displayed it in a uh, violin case. My, my parents were violinists, so I had access to a violin case. So I displayed the gun in the violin case. And this is a story of me not taking Mr. Peeler's advice. And it, it didn't turn out well, as you'll find out. So, yeah, I'm going to tell the whole story. So, uh, Mr. Peeler was one of the judges for this art show, and he, you know, I'm standing there by my Tommy gun. I was proud of it. It was, it, 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 what do you call it, uh, photorealism. Yeah, I thought oh, it was, it was super then. realistic. Yeah, it looked real. It did. And the, and the violin case just made the display perfect. So, Mr. Peeler, he's looking at it and goes, uh, he gave me the look. <laughs> and he goes, well, David, you know, I, I can appreciate the craftsmanship, but this should never have been made. <laughs> <laughs> he said it should never have been made. And I didn't know quite how to take that, but, you know, I was proud that he thought should've I did a good job on it. But I should have listened to him. It shouldn't have ever been made. <clears throat> so I came back to pick up the piece when the art fair was over. My Tommy gun was gone. One of the scumbag DePaul students, I think, stole it. <laughs> but they left the violin case. The violin case was still there. The Tommy gun was gone. It was so a Mr. compliment. Yeah, Mr. Peeler, he, I, I shouldn't have ever made that. So what did I do? I made another one. <laughs> I didn't take his advice. When I was, in, I was in college, by that time, I made another one. It was, it was even a little better, you know, and I displayed that. I, I had it hung up on the wall of this party house we lived in when we were students in Bloomington. And then we had a big blowout party one night while that gun disappeared. <laughs> uh, yeah, I woke up the next morning and the wall's blank. I didn't do it. <laughs> I shouldn't have ever made it. Oh, I shouldn't have ever made it. You're so lucky that the police didn't. Oh yeah, yeah that, was too, that was something. That was something. down the street. Right. I didn't know. I didn't own a car, so I had to get that that Tommy gun home from the art center on my bicycle. <laughs> and I'm, you know, I'm riding my bike, carrying this Tommy gun down, you know, down the street. I was really hoping that I would encounter a policeman. I really wanted that to happen. And I got like a half a block from home, and yeah, there was one. And I, he was. Out on a side street at the stop sign, and I just rode right by him. You know, didn't even look at him. And of course, he pulled out and yelled at me through his PA, "Stop and bring that thing here." And I was smart enough to have the barrel pointing behind me as I brought it up to him. And he got this big smile on his face, the policeman, and he, he said, "Wow." what is this? And I told him, you know, I made it in art class. And he goes, that, that, that's really cool. I could tell it wasn't real, you know, when you're walking up to me. But when you rode by on the bike, I didn't know. <laughs> so, yeah, so I displayed it on the wall in the house, and it got stolen. I, I should never have made it. <laughs> so uh, that gun was gone. So what do you think I did? I decided I should make another one. Yeah. By this, yeah, I made a third one. I still have it. It hadn't been stolen. But it should, it should never have been made, uh, because 
and this one I worked a long time on it, and it, it's it's uh, pretty detailed. So I took photographs of it, and I I'm a member of a, a Facebook group called Clay Buddies, and I and I see people they're putting their artwork up up there all the time. So I thought oh, I'm going to take I'm going to put my tongue on there and get a lot of compliments. You not to. It should never have been made. <laughs> I, I wish I had taken Mr. Peeler's advice because I put it, I put it, I put the picture up there. The very next day was the Sandy Hook School oh. massacre, and oh my gosh, I got totally flamed. People were just thought I was such a horrible person. You know, why would you put this picture up here? I should never have made that gun. It was, so yeah, I deleted the post, of course. It was, Mr. Peeler was right. I wish I had listened to him. And Todd told me, he said, do not bring that rifle today. So I did. <laughs> uh, all right. Okay, that's it. We're going to hold off on questions, but these people will be happy to stay and answer all your questions into the darkness of night, if that's what you would like. But one piece we want to bring out and show you, uh, when Chris Johnson called about donating the two pieces, uh, like I say, there was pottery everywhere in the house when I went over, or as he offered, he was, you know, he was wanting to sell the stuff, and so what did I, I wound up with a frog with uh, three toes, I think, missing about half its toes. I wound up with a three-legged turtle. Uh, but he said, I have something outside. He said, it's really beat up. He said, you may not be interested in it. But he said, come out in the shed and take a look. And so we went, I went out, and this piece was there. And he was right. It was pretty beat up. <laughs> but it was something I'd never seen before. It was a fountain. And I'd never seen a Peeler fountain. And so I thought, I looked at it. It was missing about a third of the base. And, and one of the tiers on it was missing a lot of kind of intricate work. And so he, he, was, he priced it accordingly. And I thought, well, maybe I'll take it home. Might look good in Connie's uh, lavender garden or something like that. Uh, it's been, obviously been outside for ages. I won't hurt it anymore. And so I bought it, took it home. And the next day I went back to take him the papers for the deed of gift for his donation. And he said, here, you might want this. I found this. And it was a baggie full of pieces for this wonderful piece. And it's a, it's a big piece. It's uh, right here. I'm going to roll it out because oh, Lord knows I don't want to drop it. Uh, and let's bring it over here. But it was sitting out there, and obviously it's missing a pretty good chunk at the base. And from Have you here, the pieces on yet? Have you glued the pieces? No, I'm, I'm not good enough to do that. From here to here, it's all broken off. But then when he gave me this bag, I thought, this really probably shouldn't go in our landscaping. Because the first piece I pulled out was this. And it fits perfectly. Right there. And we have pieces that go up here. I'm not sure if they're all here or not. But it's such a rare, oh, the other thing I just discovered today, when I brought it in, I decided to clean this piece up a little bit, because uh, it was all dark in here. And it's signed here, Peeler, 1979. Uh, and so I think, I mean, this is obviously a, I would call it a rare and unusual piece. Uh, and I don't know where it's been all this time, but uh, it wound up over there. Uh, and we have a, there's a company that I've been contemplating letting them restore this piece. I think it's worthy of restoration. Uh, it's called Broken Art Restoration in Beaumont, Illinois. They've done some work for the museum already. But they would make this look 
like it never happened. Uh, so, has anybody seen this piece before? I have. Well, imagine <laughs> <I have. laughs> Where? What do Where? When it was made? Yeah, okay. he, he had a, a shallow uh, cement bowl out front of the house and he made it for that. And he, he, he'd do art shows when he was at DePaul and uh, they liked to, he liked to have a fountain. He'd concrete blocks, <coughs> line it with plastic and put goldfish in and have a little fountain. Was this for the goldfish bowl? For the, I mean, was it for that? Yeah, he made it for the, yeah, the thing out in front of the house, the cement bowl out in front. <laughs> but I did, uh, it's a great piece. Obviously, it's been used. It's still got the, uh, the hose that ran the water through. So, I'm thinking, I didn't tell you that I mentioned the 20th anniversary of the museum, but what's the date in June when we're having the Big Bash? 25th. 20th. June 25th. 25th. June 25th, there at the museum, there's going to be a uh, big combination bash in our parking lot in the museum. The 20th anniversary of the museum, the 200th anniversary of the city, and the 202 anniversary of the county. And I thought maybe we could have this going by then and it could be our chocolate fountain. Wouldn't that be? <laughs> 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 no, 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 no. If you notice, because this is a, it's a purple tint. Uh -huh. Well, um, that, so that tells me this glaze has magnesium in it. Because with, with, the, um, with cobalt, which gives glue, is on a, a glaze with magnesium, it turns purple. And that's, you know, and then this would be from iron. So that's uh, what is the glaze called? MG2. That MG2. MG2. Yeah. So that's the piece. Nice, cool. nice one. Anybody that feels compelled <laughs> to contribute to the restoration, talk to Lisa. <laughs> it is a great piece. And we'll be here at the museum after it's done. All right, come on up, talk to these people, look at their pottery. <laughs>